exceptional webinar series organized by Department of Biotechnology, IMS Engineering College, Ghazibad. IMS Engineering College is one of the top notch engineering colleges in North India. It is NAT accredited in uh, with grade A for five years for maintaining world class quality in education and infrastructure. The Department of Biotechnology was established in the year 2002 with an undergraduate engineering program in biotechnology. In the year 2010, master's course in biotechnology was introduced to cater higher education requirements of students. Since its inception, the department has continuously grown and taken initiatives to quality education and inculcate research aptitude in biotechnology students. The department is actively engaged in research activities in various areas of biotechnology and related fields. Major research focus areas are herbal cosmetics and medicine, cancer biology, parasitology, bioinformatics, fermentation biology, to name a few. The department is also an authorized research center for PhD program through AKTU Lucknow. This indeed is a lovely afternoon. And it gives us immense pleasure that you all have gathered here through this online forum in this international webinar. I again request all the participants to keep the microphone and camera off throughout the webinar. Please do not share your screen. We will be taking your questions at the end. I feel delighted to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Ashish A. Prabhu. Dr. Prabhu did his Bachelor of Engineering in Biotechnology from Vishweshwarya Technological University, Belgaum. He pursued his MTech in Industrial Biotechnology from Manipal Institute of Technology, MIT, Karnataka, Manipal. He did his PhD in Biosciences and Bioengineering from IIT, Guwahati. Thereafter, he joined Tata Institute of Genetics and Society, Bangalore as a research associate. Currently, Dr. Prabhu is working as postdoctoral research fellow at Center for Climate and Environmental Protection at School of Water, Energy and Environment. Cranfield University, UK. He has published many papers in journals of international repute. We at Department of Biotechnology, IMS Engineering College, welcome you, sir, and thank you for taking out time to share your thoughts with us. Over to you now, Dr. Ashish. Thank you very much for the warm welcome, and uh, let me start with my presentation now. Dr. Ashish. Yes. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, yes, we can hear you, Ashish. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. you can continue. Yeah, yeah. so let me uh, start showing my screen. Yeah, can you see my presentation? Just a second. Hello? I think. Yeah. Uh, Somebody is sharing screen, I think. Someone else has shared his Sharul Lata. All the participants are requested not to share their screen. Yes, Asis. Uh, yeah. You share so, your screen. Yeah, yeah. You start your presentation. Yeah. Is it visible? My presentation is visible for all? Yeah, it's presenting. Yeah, it's visible, Asis. Yeah, so uh, good uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, myself, Ashish, as uh, uh, Dr. Jaru has uh, introduced me uh, in the beginning. So currently, I'm working in the Cranfield University um, uh, as a research fellow in metabolic engineering. So uh, our objective is to engineer any cells um, of industrial importance and convert those cells into uh, 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 very important things that can convert any uh, substrate into value-added products. So in that matter, uh, we, uh, today I'm going to discuss a product called as recombinant human interferon gamma. You can take it as a model protein uh, where we can use these proteins for uh, many um, uh, antiviral activities because this has uh, the capacity of antiviral uh, capacity. So we can use this protein for antiviral uh, activities. So before that, uh, starting this uh, 
presentation, I want to give a brief introduction of what is ongoing a situation in the global scenario that is a, a global pandemic, what we call it as a coronavirus. We all know that uh, in uh, December 2019, there was an outbreak of uh, disease, uh, pneumonia-like symptoms in uh, Wuhan province, uh, in the Hubei province in China. And that is later um, uh, detected as uh, SARS, that is a severe acute respiratory syndrome. So this virus is very uh, dangerous as it infects the respiratory tract and uh, causes pneumonia-like symptoms. And um, initially it is predicted that it will be having the milder uh, infections, but later due to its severity like SARS and MERS, it has become more lethal and it causes hyperinflammation and respiratory dysfunction. So till date, it will be, it is like around 86 lakh people has been infected with this pandemic and more than 4.5 lakh people has been died with this pandemic disease. So to give a brief introduction, uh, because I'm not going to in detail with the coronavirus, uh, we are coming, why I am discussing this with coronavirus today is, it is very important to know about what kind of uh, pandemics we can face in the future and what kind of uh, biopharmaceuticals or pharmaceuticals we should have as a backup for to face this kind of situations. So to give a general information of, of coronavirus, coronavirus belong to the largest group of nidoroviral disorder. The basic characteristics of this virus is it is having a RNA size of 30 KB. It is a very a huge RNA virus. And the, com considering the RNA, but the size is very small. It's around 125 nanometer and has a comprising of four different structural proteins, called as, uh, spike proteins, membrane, envelope, and nuclear capsid proteins. The spike proteins, which gives it a shape of corona, of sun corona, hence it is named as coronavirus. And this spike protein is very important for entry inside the host um, using angiotensin converting enzyme. The genome of the SARS-CoV-2 is 75% similar to that of the SARS what is occurred previously. So, See, the pathophysiological condition of this thing is it is having a three stages, early stage, pulmonary stage, and hyperinflammation phase. In the early stage, when the person gets infected by this virus, you have uh, symptoms of mild fever, dry cough, diarrhea, and uh, mild headaches. And as the day prolongs, you have a stage two where you will have a shortness of breath and hypoxic conditions. And in the uh, in the stage three, there is hyperinflammation. There is something called as cytokine storms. When your body is infected with any pathophysiological conditions, your body immune response will be activated and it will secrete more of cytokines. These cytokines, when it is secreted, like cytokines like interferons, interleukins, monokines, lymphokines, uh, colony stimulating factors that get activated and causes acute respiratory distress syndrome that will damages your tissue uh, tissue of your lungs, causes necrosis, tissue destruction, inflection of um, leukocytes and dilation of blood vessels. So this is called as cytokine storm. So pre, uh, recently, um, University of Edinburgh has uh, uh, found that the, the dexomethasone, a steroid is very uh, showing a promising results in uh, when you reach the stage three, that is hyperinflammation phase, this steroid can um, reduce the inflammation in the stage three and uh, reduces the lethality of this virus. Uh, previously in India also, they uh, determined that hydroxychloroquine, that is anti-malarial is used for, it can be used for this uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2, but nothing is promising. Uh, there are few studies uh, ongoing using remedisvir loponovir, retinovir, these are all the antiviral proteins that is being used uh, to uh, in the clinical trial that is shown uh, promising results with the SARS-CoV. But there are also incident that along with this antiviral protein, some of the interferons like interferon alpha 2b, interferon beta has shown uh, very good results in regulating the SARS-CoV. So that brings us with the question that Yes, we have to be prepared with the, this kind of uh, uh, pandemics in the future and we should be ready with all kind of biopharmaceuticals. So biopharmaceuticals or pharmaceuticals, what you call it, is a very important um, key factor now. So biopharmaceuticals 
uh, if you can define in a broader perspective, it is like it is a biological, uh, it is a product that is derived from the biological source. You can call it as recombinant therapeutic proteins or enzymes or nucleic acid or nucleic acid analogs, which gives you around 17 to 15 percent of the annual growth rate and 70 to 80 billion dollar per annum market value. It is estimated before COVID, maybe now it is much more than that what we are expecting. So coming to the classification of the biopharmaceuticals, we can classify the biopharmaceuticals into various categories, the cytokines, enzymes, hormones, clotting factors, vaccines, monoclonal antibody, and antisense drugs. Today, we are majorly focused on cytokines as a biopharmaceutical product. So cytokines can be broadly classified into lymphokines, monokines, interferons, interleukins, quality stimulating factors, and tumor necrosis factors. So we are basically focused now on interferons in the cytokines. So interferons are the proteins that is produced in the uh, cells so when the cells are exposed to pathophysiological condition, that is any cells that is infected with the bacteria or viral particles. So what is it is it belongs to the glycoprotein of cytokines. Uh, the name interferons derive from the word interfere because this interferons can interfere with the RNA synthesis and replication of the virus. It can induce apoptosis in the cells and also it starts the series of cascading events in the immunological cells like it can activate uh, natural killer cells, it can activate granulocytes, much more than that. So based on the sequence homology and uh, receptor binding sites, we can classify interferons into two broader categories, that is type 1 and type 2 category. In type 1 category, we have alpha, beta, tau, and omega. Further, we can subclassify this as alpha 1b, alpha 2b, beta 1b, beta 2b, and so on. And in type 2 uh, uh, interferons, we have only one type of interferons called as interferon gamma. And uh, as you see here, uh, I have given the sources of that. The type 1 interferons are um, majorly produced by the dendritic cells or fibroblast, whereas the type 2 cells, it is majorly produced by CD4, CD8, cytotoxic T cells, and natural killer cells. Interferon gamma is a type 2 cytokines, very important cytokines in the biological perspective. Secreted by CD4, CD8, cytotoxic T1 lymphocytes. When your cells get infected with any uh, virus or bacterial particles, what happens is the major thing uh, that inv when uh, invasion happens, the, it comes to the location is macrophages and natural killer cells. Macrophages will release a um, chemical called as chemokines that activates uh, interleukin-12 and interleukin-18. In turn, this interleukin-12 and interleukin-18 acts as a bridge and enhances the activity of interferon gamma. Once the interferon gamma is activated, it will start a series of immunological events by activating different immune cells. So currently, the interferon gamma is used for the treatment of chronic granulomatous disease and malignant osteopetrosis disease. So to be um, precise with this uh, disease, uh, chronic granulomatous is a condition where the cell loses its um, ability to attack any pathogens like it has defective macrophages due to the defective NADH oxidase present in the phagocytosis process and the malignant osteopetrosis is the situation where uh, you know we all know that the, there is two cells in that uh, majorly response for bone forming osteoblast and osteoclast osteoblast is the cells that is responsible for the formation of the bone cells where the osteoclast is the cells that is formation of removal of the old cells if there is any defect in the osteoclast that leads to the accumulation of bone, uh, more bone cells, it is like a tumors. So what happens is it clogs the bone marrow, reduces the platelet count, in, increases the infectiv in, infectivity rate in the uh, humans. So to, for the treatment of these things, inter interferon gamma is approved for the treatment. So Coming to the structural uh, activity or structural pro property of the interferons, interferons uh, is a homodimeric n glycosylated proteins with the no disulfide uh, bridges here. So uh, a mature 
human interferon gamma is 143 amino acids. Basically, it is 166 amino acids. If we leave 23 amino acid, which is a signal peptide, it is 143 amino acid, which is a majorly uh, showing the major activity of this. And the molecular weight will vary from 17 to 24 keda, uh, depending upon the glycosylation pattern of it. And the isoelectric point is around 8.7, consisting of majorly arginine and lysine residues with it. So as I told you that once the interferon gamma is activated, it will channelize the series of immuno, Im, immun, immune cells, that is natural killer cells. It uh, helps in the addition of M, uh, class 1, MH1, MHC, one or two types, differentiation of B cells, proliferation of T cells, macrophage acti activation, and so on. So this um, interferon gamma follows JAK-STAT pathway. The JAK-STAT pathway is uh, uh, where you have two uh, receptors, that is interferon gamma R1 receptor, R2 receptor. And when the antigen binds to this receptor, it will bring these two receptors. And the Janus kinase will get phosphorylated and dimerized. Once it gets phosphorylated and dimerized, it will phosphorylate the STAT1 protein, which undergo the phosphorylation and dimerization again, and which activates the gamma activated sequence and initiate the fraction of transcription act, um, uh, interferon gamma receptor factor one. This is a transcription factor that enhances the uh, immune cells functioning. So as I told you, what is the application currently? Uh, the Food and Drug Administration, US FDA, has approved this um, uh, drug for treatment of granulom uh, granulomatous disease and malignant uh, osteopetrosis. Apart from this, there is other ongoing research on tuberculosis renal carcinoma and dermatitis. Uh, most of the cancers and tuberculosis uh, has been uh, investigated with uh, this drug. And recently, they are also investigating this uh, coronavirus with uh, this drug, along with the other antiviral proteins. So there are a few companies that is producing this um, uh, drug, that is um, Actimmune, Imukin, and Gamma Humanex. But in a country like India, there is no company that is currently focused on this uh, protein. Uh, so what is the advantages and disadvantages of thing is uh, average person with chronolo, uh, chronic granulomatous disease is known to take three dosage of 50 MCU and 100 microgram of this uh, protein cost you around 330 US dollars. So the whole course, like it is to be taken with a nine month course and the whole course cost you around 20 lakh rupees. That is quite expensive. So what make it very expensive? Like the human interferon gamma is uh, produced, currently produced in industries with the two different hosts. So one host is mammalian cells. So the advantages of mammalian, mammalian cells, uh, such as HEK cells or CHO cells, Chinese hamster ovary or human kidney cells. So they, uh, human embryonic kidney cells. So they take these cells and they clone the gene of human interferon gamma. The advantages of this uh, producing in mammalian cells is it is properly glycosylated, but the disadvantage is very low productivity, expensive media because they are using uh, serum in it, and a lot of contamination problem with it. Alternatively, if you come to the prokaryotic system, that is bacterial system, E. coli is used as a workhorse in many of the industries. So the advantages of using E. coli is high production, high cell density, but the disadvantage is it is having the inclusion bodies. The protein is not folded properly. Lack of glycosylations that is uh, that limits its um, half life in the serum, and difficulty in downstream processing because majorly it is having endotoxins. So you have to separate endotoxins before it is going to the human trial or as a medicines. So each one has its advantages and disadvantages. So to overcome this, people are trying with the different host systems. Even they tried with uh, insect cell lines like baculovirus. So th it is also having the problem. So one more option is Pichia pastoris. So people are, are worked with the Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Yeah, that is a major uh, yeast system that is a very well-known system uh, used for ethanol production as well as the production of recombinant proteins. But the problem with uh, using Saccharomyces cerevisiae yeah, is when you use Saccharomyces cerevisiae, yeah, the protein will get hyperglycosylation that we will discuss in the uh, upcoming slides. So Cometogulla pasteuris is one of the workhorse that all our focus like past few decades 
uh, so much work is going on um, Pichya Pastoris, which belongs to the family of Kometagala Pastoris. So this is initially uh, in 1950s, 1960s, it is used as a single cell protein uh, by a company called as Philip Petroleum. Then uh, a company called as Salk Institute in America, they have developed many of the expression system for this and they have transferred this to the company called as RCT, which is known as Invitrogen today and which is under Thermo Scientific. So most of the uh, cells and its uh, plasmids are available with this industry now. So it has used as a workhorse and used to produce more than 500 proteins. It is mo much more than that now. It's around 700 or 800 proteins by now. So the Pichia Pastoris has, uh, as a system, it can metabolize methanol as a sole carbon source. That is a one advantage of this. Apart from that, it has uh, many advantages compared with that of other um, host system, like it can have a high cell density fermentation, ease of genetic manipulation, as they have developed um, many uh, genetic tools for that. Uh, recently, they have also developed a CRISPR tool where you can uh, knock in or knock out the genes in it. So uh, advantage is the protein is extracellular. So it secretes the protein extracellular that you know in, you need not to break up on the cells and for uh, getting the proteins. And grass approved, it is, it is free from uh, endotoxins and having the post translation modification as humanized form. So this is the main advantages of using Pichia Pastoris. So uh, when it comes to methanol metabolism, when the methanol, it uptakes the methanol in the peroxisome and um, there is an enzyme called as alcohol oxidase that cleaves this methanol into formaldehyde as well as the hydrogen peroxide. Uh, the hydrogen peroxide is uh, very toxic to the cells. So uh, enzyme called as catalase will break down this hydrogen peroxide into water and molecule of oxygen. And the uh, formaldehyde, what it is produced here, it will go uh, two pathways. One is dissimilatory pathway where it will meet the reduced glutathione and undergoes a formation of ca uh, carbon dioxide. And in assimilatory pathway, the formaldehyde under, under the uh, enzyme activity of dihydroxyacetone synthase converted into dihydroxyacetone and glycerol D3-phosphate uh, combining with xylulose 5-phosphate that is generated through pentose pathway and enters the glycolysis. So these are the two pathways that it follows after the methanol metabolism. Yes, so coming to the main uh, agenda of this thing is uh, process development. To, uh, we, with the focus of process development strategies of any recombinant protein for that matter, we have to consider from upstream to downstream. So upstream in the sense we have, um, you can, uh, if you have a wild type stream, that's well enough. If you have a uh, recombinant strain, then you can develop its genetic aspects by uh, selecting a, a very right promoters, it is strong promoter, either indivisible promoter or constitutive promoters. You can optimize the codon optimizations, gene copy numbers, signal peptides, and also you can try with the different chaperons that helps in the folding activity. And also when it, when it is done, you can go for um, media optimizations, um, and pa process parameter optimization such as EH, temperature, nutrient supply, etc. And also you can establish any mathematical models in uh, using a batch and fed batch uh, cultivation strategies. Once it is done, you can go for purification methods. Purification is, uh, is a more important thing that it will come in a completely separate part from the upstream. So that is where we focused on. So now we will be discussing two important aspects uh, of um, uh, process development of interferon gamma is one is how we can uh, engineer a cell to produce more of a proteins and second is what we can develop uh, how we can uh, use a strategy to develop um, a, a new media that can have a more productivity uh, of interferon gamma so coming to this when we started uh, uh, this experiment we got uh, a 432 base space gene from uh, Professor Howard from uh, NIH USA. And we, uh, this is a cDNA, and we cloned this uh, cDNA in a, a vector called as P pick Z alpha. P pick Z alpha, it is having a, it is an alcohol oxidase, it is an inducible promoter. Okay. So we cloned the gene of interest in the under the inducible promoter alcohol oxidase. And uh, 
which is transformed uh, into the Pichia pastoris cell um, that is uh, and selected based on the zeosin. Zeosin is the antibiotic resistance in this. And we selected 10 to 10, uh, 20 colonies and conducted a small scale expression of uh, interferon gamma productivity using uh, ELISA techniques. So we used three different strains in the Pichia pastoris. This is GS115, KM71, and X33. So GS115 and uh, KM71 are oxotrophic strain, and X33 strain is a wild type strain. So uh, also we have checked its um, methanol uh, utilizability. There is three uh, type of methanol utilizability in this. Mute plus, mute s, and mute minus. Mute s, mute plus is methanol uh, uh, utilizing type. Mute s is low methanol utilizing type, and mute minus is no methanol utilizing type. This can be uh, determined uh, using growing the uh, recombinant strains in the plate containing of methanol as a sole carbon source. If it is growing at the actual rate in that of the YPD or MDH, it is a plate containing of dextrose. That means it is. Uh, it, it, it utilizes the methanol as a sole carbon source and if not if it is growing slowly it is considered as slow growing and if it is not growing it is considered as methanol non-utilizing type so majorly we got methanol utilizing type of strains and in that strains gs115 the oxotrophic strains we got around 220 microgram per liter of proteins in it so considering the bioprocess 220 microgram per liter is too small uh, so one possibility we thought that uh, since uh, uh, recalling the previous papers what we referred uh, interferon gamma is a complex protein uh, in the e coli it forms um, uh, aggregates it a protein aggregates and forms uh, insoluble proteins so we thought that may that might be the conditions uh, of unfolded protein responses so what is unfolded protein responses um, Whenever uh, a cell produces a proteins, so if the protein is not folded properly, so there is a, a serine threonine uh, receptors, trans transmembrane receptor present in the, in the lumen of endoplasmic reticulum. When your protein is not folded properly, what happens is this transmembrane receptors will undergo dimerizations and autophosphorylations, which secre which liberates. Uh, protein called as car 2 p it is it symbolizes binding immunoglobulin protein so this binding immunoglobulin proteins will activate the hac1 protein which leaves the introns of it and makes a active exons and activates the unprotein uh, response target genes so in this there is two two distinct factors one is when the upr is activated it can simulate a um, chaperon called as PDI. PDI is a protein disulfide isomerase where it will break open the protein and properly join the disulfide linkages and secretes the protein outside. If the protein is un, uh, it, if this chaperone is unable to fold the protein, the UPR activates ERAD pathway, endoplasmic reticulum activated uh, degradations where most of the protease is secreted and it will be cleaving the proteins into peptide molecules that will reduce your protein of interest. So thinking of that, we have used five different chaperons uh, for uh, this uh, uh, process. So that is CAR2P, that is binding immunoglobulin proteins. The activity of this protein is um, helps in the translocation and uh, it works with the SAC pathway for uh, proper uh, channelizing the proteins uh, to the cytoplasm. So this belongs to the HSP70 uh, family HSP70 is based on the molecular weight. It is a heat shock protein 70. 70 is the 70 kda molecule. 70 kda is this size. So PDI is a protein disulfide isomerase. Helps in the disulfide bonding and proper folding of the proteins. We have other two uh, endoplasmic reticulum associated uh, chaperones that is SSA1P and YDJ1P that belongs to the HSP70 and 40 families. So the HSA1P helps in the proper folding and translocation of this protein to endoplasmic reticulum. Whereas the YDJ1P, that is HSP40, that um, uh, helps in the regulation of ATP dependent cyclase activity of SSA1 protein and signal processing. So SEC33 is a one more signal peptide processing 
pro, uh, chaperones that is helpful that works with the binding immunoglobulin proteins and helps in the translocation of the proteins so first strategy what we used is we cloned all these chaperones individually like individual in um, uh, individually uh, in the uh, cells containing the human interferon gamma gene and saw the effect of uh, the protein secretions and we found that the ydj pro, uh, chaperones that is a uh, uh, hsp 40 class chaperones and the pdi chaperone showed the pronounced effect of interferon gamma one ca one reason of using a ydj protein is ydj chaperone is it is a consisting of axl1 proteins which helps in the signal peptide processing as well as folding as uh, so it has shown the pronounced effect and we got around 0.75 uh, mg per liter that is 750 microgram per liter that is almost uh, three fold three to three four three to four fold increase in uh, the protein production what we observed in the previously so in the next strategy we use the synergetic effect we started cloning uh, with a different uh, uh, pace of uh, chaperones and uh, we when we did that we saw that the car 2 p um, with a PDI showed the uh, almost six fold increase in the protein production causing around 1.4 mg per liter of protein productions. So I have shown a diagrammatically how it works. So as I told binding immunoglobulin proteins are the proteins uh, chaperones that is responsible for the activation of unfolded protein response. And also it helps with the uh, translocation of the protein working with the sac proteins. And the pre protein disulfide isomerase, which helps in the proper uh, isomerization of disulfide bonds and translocation of it. So together, this synergetic worked very well and call, uh, gave us a very good result of protein productions. Also, uh, when you clone any uh, gene, uh, like a heterologous gene inside the cells, it causes a metabolic burden for the cells. And if you see that uh, if it is the complex protein and it started UPR like unfolded protein responses, the cellular activity will be very less in this. So when we uh, use these chaperones, it has reduced the metabolic burden. It has showed that it is the proper translocation of pro proteins and the growth has been, the uh, log phase of the growth has been enhanced by 24 hours compared to that of the uh, strain which is containing only human interferon gamma gene. Further, we carried out uh, uh, mathematical modeling using uh, logistic-based modeling. And uh, this is the logistic-based models, what we used. And uh, this is uh, the uh, ludicrous pirate equation for a product product uh, formation. So why we use the lo logistic equation is we, can, we could have used the monod equation, but monod equation is dependent on substrate. We are using two substrate here. One is uh, glycerol and one one more is uh, methanol. So to avoid those things, we directly went for uh, logistic model because logistic model is devoid of the substrate thing. So we used only biomass as a uh, model in here. And then we used the ludicrous pirate equations for simulating what kind of production it is. It is either it is a, a growth dependent product or non growth dependent product. And the simulation of the model is done using a uh, Simulink. Uh, that is a MATLAB tool. You can use it for uh, simulating these models. And uh, when we simulated this, uh, we got um, the parameter estimates like this. Uh, initial biomass will be around 0.388 gram per liter, whereas the final biomass it's reached in the complex media, I'm telling, with uh, almost two, 20 gram per liter of uh, methanol and 20 gram per liter of uh, glycerol, we got around 2.14 gram of uh, biomass. The specific growth rate will be around 0.143 per hour. And the um, strain showed the productivity will be around uh, growth phase during the growth phase. That means it is a growth associated product. You can see uh, much of the growth product, uh, protein production in the lock phase, not in the stationary, not in the lag phase. So that will be predicted here. And the prediction of R square, the model is fitted with a 95% accurate, accurate, uh, accuracy. Further uh, moving, we also tried with, um, because translation is a major uh, uh, process in uh, protein synthesis. So what happens is when you clone any gene from one strain to another strain, there will be something called as codon bias. So there will be non, um, so what we did is we removed uh, the uh, codon bias uh, 
um, and uh, use the proper codon bias that is um, actually working with that of the Pichia Pastoris. And um, initially, the codon adaptation index, the CAI index, what we call it as, uh, it gives you the translation efficiency in the particular strain. When we use the native uh, gene, it is around 0.69. And when we did the codon optimization, removing the rare codons and um, replacing it with the preferred codons, we got the CAI index of 0.88. Also, the GC content was around 38% in the native uh, uh, interferon, what we got it from uh, the mammalian cells. But uh, it, uh, when the codon optimization is done, the GC content is adjusted to 42.92%. And also we have checked the mRNA structure of these things that has given 20% improvement in the structure with the data free energy. Further, we uh, synthesized this gene from uh, Invitrogen company and cloned this gene in the same PPXZ alpha vector where under the uh, alcohol oxidase promoted. And without any chaperone things, we saw the production of around 1.8 mg per liter. That means uh, the major problem is with the, not not only with only the uh, translocation part, but it is with the translational part because the mRNA is not working properly because of the codon bias things. So it is very pronounced that 1.8 mg per liter with a codon optimization strategy we achieved. This is uh, one of the highest uh, protein we got uh, without optimizations. So further, we have optimized the process parameters such as temperature, pH, methanol concentration, agitation, and inoculum. So methanol, uh, so coming to the temperature, show that a lower temperature, usually the um, temperature what we use is around 30 degrees centigrade. It is the optimal for uh, Pichia pastoris or any kind of yeast, but we reduce the temperature to 25. Uh, one uh, reason of getting a, a higher protein in 25 degrees centigrade is lower, lower uh, temperature will reduces the protease activity because we also detected some of the protease activity in this uh, matter that will cleave uh, the protein of interest. So when you reduce the temperature, there is a reduced protease activity. Also, you will get more time for uh, proper uh, uh, translation of uh, the proteins. Also, pH 7 seems to be optimum for uh, the interferon gamma and the methanol concentration. Methanol, we use it as an inducer here. So when we use lower methanol concentration, maybe the cells didn't induce properly. And when we use the higher methanol concentration around 2%, there may be a formaldehyde toxicity. So the 1% um, is, was seen to be optimum for the uh, human interferon gamma productions and uh, agitation that is very important for, because uh, since it is growth associated pro product and uh, the Pichia pastoris is majorly dependent on the oxygen for the oxidation of methanol. So higher aeration is required. So we expected around uh, uh, we, uh, 250 uh, RPM is the maximum RPM what we can get uh, to get the protein of interest. And uh, with all these things, we got around 2.5 mg per liter of proteins, which is almost 10 to 12 fold higher than what the protein we got it in uh, previously with the wild type strain. So then we conducted a purification of recombinant human interferon gamma. So uh, what we did is since the protein is extracellular, we taken the protein uh, for uh, amino sulfate uh, amino, um, amino sulfate precipitations with the 80% cutoff value, and then we have undergone the dialysis. Uh, then the protein is being purified using nickel NTA because we have histidine tag with it. So we uh, uh, purified the protein using nickel NTA tags. So once the protein is purified, we also determined the Western protein uh, techniques. Was the protein purified protein is uh, evaluated with the uh, cytotoxic uh, studies and LDHSA. Uh, we basically wanted to test because we have referred some of the literatures that um, this is uh, this protein is active against the skin, ca skin cancer cell lines. So we used A43 uh, squamous uh, uh, cells for uh, the, uh, to determine the biological activity of this. So we have conducted dose dependent and time dependent assays. And it is seen that uh, until 40 nanogram per ml, it has been not seen any uh, activity of uh, this protein. After 40 nanogram, with the 80 nanogram of protein, it has shown 50% decrease in the cell viability using MTTSA. 
so the mtt assay is a uh, basically a calorimetric assay which uh, determines the viability of the cells so mtt is uh, uh, it is a tetrazoleum dye it is yellow in color and uh, when it is reduced by the nadph oxidase that is present in the mitochondria it will change the color to purple color so based on the intensity of this colors we can determine how much cells are viable with the treatment of the uh, proteins so to uh, it is seen that almost 50% of the cells is not viable after using 80 uh, nanogram per ml of uh, proteins we as a control we wanted to try with that of is it the is our protein of interest is working as same as that of the commercial enzymes like commercial protein that is available in the market so we got a protein commercial protein and it showed a similar activity that of our recombinant proteins also we have determined the ldh activity ldh is a lactate dehydrogenase that is present in the cytosol when the cell break opens or ruptures it indicates the rupturing of the cells and uh, the liberation of this ldh in the broth is clear indication of cell disruptions so it is seen that with the standard that is the uh, uh, commercially available uh, interferon gamma and uh, recombinant interferon gamma what we achieved we got a very similar result and it is clearly indi indicating uh, the disruption of cells with respect to time and dosage so to conclude this study uh, it is like uh, we have cloned initially the 432 base base gene of interferon gamma in the uh, gso non y strain and which resulted around 200 microgram per liter of proteins and to overcome the bottlenecks associated with the uh, uh, translocation part we have uh, cloned uh, hsp70 and hsp40 cytoplasmic and endoplasmic reticulum based uh, chaperons and in that ydj1 in the with a single uh, chaperon as well as car 2p and pdi uh, with a synergistic effect has shown the more effective uh, protein production further that tra uh, trans uh, translational rate has been improved by codon adaptation uh, codon optimization strategy and it will seen that around 1.8 mg per liter of interferon gamma is produced with this so the process parameter optimization like uh, optimizing the methanol ph temperature inoculum size and agitation rate has shown around 2.5 mg per liter of interferon gamma productions in the second part uh, we are seeing the optimization strategies so we have used uh, some of the statistical based and um, neural network based strategy to optimize the media compositions that is uh, to modify the previously uh, reported media to a well known media for our protein of interest so we used first uh, first thing what we did is we screened some of the carbon sources for the um, protein productions we have used eight different carbon sources uh, basically glycerol and sorbitol are used generally in um, uh, pichia pastoris as a one of the favored uh, carbon source apart from uh, with the methanol apart from that we have uh, based on the literature we have used maltose mannitol galactose lactose whey and gluconate for the protein productions and it was very well observed that the gluconate has pronounced activity it was given around 6.5 mg per liter of uh, human interferon gamma but the specific active uh, specific growth rate was less compared to that of the uh, glycerol and galactose what we achieved the main mode of taking the gluconate in the uh, pichia pastoris cells is there is an enzyme called as glucokinase that convert gluconate into gluconate 6 phosphate and uh, the phosphogalactone dehydrogenase that convert glucose 6 phosphate to regulose 5 phosphate with the one liberation of one nadph molecule this is a precursor molecule for the biomass formations that is where we are expecting that the this is pronounce the effect of any, um, uh, the protein molecules and once it is done it is enters the glycolysis pathway so apart from the uh, carbon source we also screen nitrogen source because nitrogen source is very important uh, for um, carbon catabolism so carbon metabolism gene is very much dependent on the what type of nitrogen source we used if you use poor, poor nitrogen source that will uh, reduces our chance of getting high protein so what we used is some of the organic and inorganic source of um, uh, uh, nitrogen source that is ammonia urea glycine glutamic acid ammonium sulfate and sodium nitrate in that we found glycine has shown the pronounced effect in the production of 
human interferongamma producing around 9.3 mg per liter of um, human interferongamma so and the specific growth rate is also well and it is seen that the when we use glycine glycine is a very cheaper um, amino acids among all the amino acid what we can get and it is comparable uh, the the rate is very much comparable to the uh, ammonium sulfate that is a commonly used nitrogen source the overall idea of getting this media optimization is to reduce the cost because previously we used complex media which is having a each nitrogen base or peptone or yeast extract that is not industrially feasible and we will cut down the cost of those things by using a uh, pure source and defined source so so only we are trying to develop a defined media for the protein enhanced protein productions so when we used glycine which is a uh, one of the cheapest amino acid source so uh, one thing is it is a liberation of ammonia is taking place in this which uh, keeps up the ph of the um, broth also second thing is uh, using glycine it has been reported that some of the peptidoglycan layer is solubilized using a, a glycine which helps in the translocation of the proteins so that is why we use the glycine or use gluconate and the glycine as a carbon and nitrogen source in the upcoming studies so next we also tried with the cas uh, effect of cas amino acid why cas amino acid cas amino acid is nothing but uh, hydrolyzed uh, proteins so uh under stationary phase when the cell enters stationary phase there is a secretion of protease molecules that cleaves your protein of interest and utilize that pep, uh, amino acids for their growth to overcome this if you supplement with using the uh, cas amino acids that uh, enhances the uh, reduction of your protein of interest and also you will get more protein of interest uh, in in uh, the fermentations so when we saw um the effect of that there is not much difference using 1% amino uh, cas amino acid with the, the control control is no ca cas amino acid and uh, here we used 1% cas amino acid and we have not uh, seen uh, much uh, statistical significance with uh, using the cas amino acid so we have left over with the cas amino acid also we have tried with the baffled flask and non baffled flask so as i told you previously aeration plays a very major role in methanol um oxidations and uh, baffled flask are known to use for the yeast system for more of the aerations so when we use baffled flask with the control that is a non baffled flask we didn't find any much of uh, the difference in uh, baffled flask and non baffled flasks so we uh, tend to grow with no amino acid and no baffled flask uh, using gluconate and glycine as a carbon and nitrogen source there so then we have adopted the plaquet berman screening strategy and it is a fractional factorial designs so used for uh, the screening of uh, media components or for for that matter you can screen any of the process parameters one advantage of using statistical based method compared to that of the uh, traditional one parameter at a time method is first thing you will get more of the interaction time and with a less number of experiments you will get a more optimum uh, value for all this media compositions or process parameter compositions so when we adopted plaquet berman screening we have chosen nine different parameters uh, with uh, you can see there is uh, levels of that what we used and uh, this level is based on the previously uh, reported the literatures as well as some of the experiments carried out in our lab so based on the design we carried out 12 different experiments set of experiments showing the interaction between each of these variables and we got around uh, 16 mg per liter of uh, protein which is highest protein uh, uh, interferon gamma till now so the model has shown the predictivity of 99.42% that is 99.42% of the error can be explained in the model that is the data fitting is so accurate Uh, this and most of these parameters that is gluconate glycine ks2po4 and histidine gluconate glycine are the carbon and nitrogen source ks2po4 is a uh, the phosphate source and histidine is the major amino acid required for the growth of the uh, uh, gs115 because it is a oxotroph so this has shown a, a very significant effect on the production of uh, protein you can see this this is called as pyreto chart and uh, what the value it is shown the 4.30 is a standard t value whichever 
uh, bar that is crossing this T value is uh, significant on the protein production. So you can see that KHTO4, PO4, histidine, glycine, gluconate has shown uh, a pronounced effect on the human interferon gamma. Based on that, we have taken the these four components, keeping all other uh, components in the mid value and uh, taking these uh, components and we have varied these components with the three, three different levels. That is low level, minus one is the low level, zero is the mid level and one is the high level. And we used box Benken design for, this is a full factorial design, we used box Benken design for uh, further optimization. You can see this model fits in the quadratic uh, polynomial. Uh, this beta naught is the constant. Bi xi, bi is the constant for the linear term. Xi is the linear term. Bij is the constant for interaction term. Xi and xj is the interaction term between two factors. And Bii and xi square, this is the uh, constant for the square term. And this is the factor for the square term. So when we conducted the experiments, we conducted uh, the experiment in uh, 27 different uh, numbers and which is having the uh, three center points. Center points in the sense we keep every value in the mid, mid, mid point to assi assist the error in this. And we saw that it is a quadratic equation what we got after uh, fitting this model. And uh, we can see there is a uh, observed value and there is a predicted value in this which is very much similar to this and when we saw the ANOVA of this this analysis of variance model the model f value showed uh, higher than that of the table f value for the degrees of freedom and uh, the probability what we used uh, that means the model is very significant with a 98.65 percent r square and most of the uh, linear terms as well as the interaction term is shown significance apart from x1, x2, x1, x7, x2, x3. That represents uh, gluconate uh, glycine. Uh, here it is gluconate hist uh, histidine and uh, glycine and uh, Ks2PO4. This shown um, quite uh, insignificance. Apart from that, most of the uh, parameters in the interaction terms has shown the significant values. Also, uh, we have shown it in the response surface models. This is a surface model. You can see that in most of the parameters, the mid value is showing a very high concentration of uh, human interferon. That means if you vary the concentration of glycine from 2 gram to 20 gram here, there is increase with the increase in the concentration of glycine. And as you increase with a much higher concentration, there is a decline in the human interferon gamma. So even with the gluconate, you can see that with the increase in the concentration of gluconate, there is an increase in the human interferon gamma production, and there is a decline. There, there is something called a substrate inhibitions uh, happening, a phenomenon happening with this process that will be it, at higher concentration, you will be seeing a decline human interferon gamma productions. Further optimizations. So um, whatever the optimization will be used with the statistical optimization is based on the linear based models. So we use uh, most of the biological models are uh, complex models and it is non-linear system. So we try to use uh, something called as artificial neural networks. Uh, the concept is very simple. The artificial neural networks works on the sy system of human neurons, which consist of dendrites, axon, and synapses. So here, uh, the dendrites is considered as input, input variable. We have taken the same input variable from the box beacon design. That is uh, Ks2PO4, glycine, gluconate, and histidine. And uh, the output value is nothing but our human interferon gamma productions. In between this input and output variables, we have something called as weights. Weights is nothing but the parameters. And uh, the, the uh, there is a transfer function in between. The, there is something called as hidden layer. This is the hidden layer here, which acts as an axon here. So the all the processing will be done in the hidden layer and will be transferred to the output layer. So what happens is uh, when you uh, give the input value here, the weights will combine and process it here using the mathematical function called as time seek is a hidden layer. And from the hidden layer, there is one more transfer function called as pure lin that linearizes the function and give you the output. So we have used feed forward back propagation method feed forward in the sense you will use you are feeding the uh, 
all the parameters from the front and it will give you uh, the parameters that is human interferon gamma value here based on the mean square error minimization it will again calculate the value and send and um, changes your input value so this is how it will works further the neural network is combined with the genetic algorithm genetic algorithm is based on darwin's uh, law of evolutions where you have a um, uh, survival of fittest you take the two fittest values and it undergoes crossing over and mutation to pro, uh, produce a more stable uh, progeny the progeny that is uh, having a more productivity than that of the parental value so when we do this when you use this uh, methodology we will expect to get a more uh, stable production production over respective generations so this is the concept of using a genetic algorithm here so when we combine this artificial neural network with the genetic algorithm uh, we found that with the eight hidden layers and four input and one output layer we got a production of 30 mg per liter of human interferon gamma and the variables which is optimized this is called as global optimum value which is optimized with the glucon of a gluconate of 50 mg per uh, 50 gram per liter glycine of 10 gram per liter h2p of 4 of 35 gram per liter and histidine of 0.264 gram per liter will give you the concentration of 30 mg per liter. Uh, remember that we started the production of uh, protein with uh, 200 microgram per liter. Now we reached in 30 mg per liter of protein productions with the optimization and uh, cell engineering strategies. Further, we have used the uh, batch reactor kinetics, similarly what we used in the previous um, things, but we have used with the uh, complex media. Here we are used with the defined media now. So here we can see that the biomass production is uh, there around 2.4. Here it is 12.46 gram per liter. And uh, the specific growth rate is less, but you can see that the productivity is still a growth associated product and the model fitting is around 94.94%. Uh, to conclude this, um, we got gluconate and glycine as a prominent uh, carbon and nitrogen source for the production of human interferon gamma. This is the first study which is showing gluconate and glycine effect on the human interferon gamma production. And also we have adopted uh, several statistical as well as the neural network based models for screening, uh, for uh, optimizing the screen variables. And we found with the batch reactor kinetics, we achieved a, a maximum of 40 mg per liter. It is a uh, highest till date uh, human interferon gamma production in Pichia pastoris, what it is reported. So we have published this in um, uh, different uh, articles like uh, uh, process biochemistry, chemical engineering science, and Korean Journal of Chemical Engineering. You can refer this for more information about this. So yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ashish, for a wonderful talk. Now, uh, we are open to the questions from the participants. The participants who want to ask any question from Dr. Ashish may please leave their question in the chat window or alternatively they can unmute themselves and ask the questions themselves. So uh, we have uh, the first question for Dr. Ashish from uh, Shutika Thakur. Uh, yes. She says, sir, uh, please explain chaperone if possible. Chaperones. Chaperones, uh, chaperones is nothing but heat shock proteins that helps in the folding of uh, any protein molecule. So it, it will bind, it will uh, create an oxidoreductase and oxidizing condition in the cell uh, that will help in the protein foldings and also the translocation. As I told, as I given the uh, series of uh, chaperones that is uh, listed there, that all proteins are helpful in the proper folding and as well as the translocation of the protein molecules. Uh, okay, uh, so we have another question from Kavya G. Uh, what yes. is the software that you are using for optimization? And I want to know about fitting of models. Is there any platform yes. to learn about it? Yes, um, there is a, uh, there is as such uh, there is some of the mo YouTube models that is available. YouTube tutorials that is available. Basically, I use for uh, mini tab. I use for statistical models. Uh, whatever the models I have did for packet Berman or box backend design, I use mini tab. And for uh, uh, kinetic fitting, I use MATLAB. MATLAB is the platform. So there are many tutorials that is available in YouTube. Uh, if if you want, uh, you can contact me. Also, I can give you the uh, procedure for how to do those things. Okay. Uh, so uh, this next question is from Anagha Nair. Uh, she's saying, sir, regarding the coronavirus. 
you said that yes. they have an enzyme for angiotensin that makes it so powerful why not try a drug that switches off the enzyme no it's not angio angiotensin is uh, the enzyme that is uh, helpful for the uptake of this uh, virus it is the acts as a receptor no, uh, there there are studies going on uh, on this things because i am not expert on this um, uh, particularly on corona virus i i just told you the fact that we can explore much of this uh, protein on this so uh, it is a just a hypothesis that uh, we can use different interferon gammas for the um, uh, stopping this coronavirus that's it as a vaccine for the coronavirus okay. uh, so the next question is from uh, narayani bhat how do you yeah. get to know whether the, the protein is intra or extra cellular and how do you extract it yes uh, when the protein is extra cellular uh, we will determine uh, what we used to do is it is simple take the broth do the elisa and we will get the uh, protein detection from the broth itself that confirm that uh, the protein is extra cellular and if you know that it is intra cellular uh, then you have to break open the cells because in the broth you will not get much of the proteins you break open the cells and you can detect the protein from the cells inside okay so uh, and uh, there is one more question uh, from karan ferol from department of botany uh, he yes. says that you know what is the difference between casein peptone and casein hydrolysate okay uh, when you uh, casein uh, peptone is uh, uh, when you break the casein with the enzyme enzymatic hydrolysis is casein hydrolysate and when you break with acid is casein uh, hydrolysate sorry casein peptone is when you break it with the enzyme and casein hydrolysate when you break it with the acid uh then uh again uh, there is a question from uh, anagha nayar it recently had read an article on ribosome interference did you yes. face any such similar problem no we uh, didn't uh, uh, wanted to know about it because we are only focused on using the chaperons as well as translocation and translation there are many other strategies we could have looked after it like uh, we could have looked after the gene dosage also and other strategies are there but uh, with this strategies like translocation and translation we got a much uh, good result so we didn't tried with that okay another question for you sir i think we have a very inquisitive audience today so uh, this yeah. question is from sushmita mahanta a uh, cas yes. amino and control didn't show much difference in the overall yield is it because yes. most of the protein is expressed during the lag phase and proteases no. are mostly active during the stationary phase if so would that mean that as soon as the proteins are produced they are released extracellularly as in immediately no no uh, see uh, as in the model also we have clearly shown that the protein is producing in the log phase uh, and uh, even with the uh, elisa which is a time dependent uh, elisa we have seen that the most of the protein produced in the lag phase and when we uh, we have tested the protease activity in the stationary phase that is very pronounced activity was seen in the stationary phase so one reason what we can give with the cas amino acid is like um, so, uh, uh, the protein is not the strain is not interested the protease is not interested in taking off the cas amino acid as a protein because maybe it is producing the proteases at the same rate that is cleaving the protein and taking the its own protein Okay. So in uh, the next case, case we we use the uh, recently we have used the protease deficient strain also. So we got a very good result with those things. So uh, uh, there are uh, two protease deficient strains that is produced by uh, Ibutrogen and Biogrammatica that we are using, and it is giving a very very good results. Okay. Uh, then our uh, next question is from Amrita Patel. Why not you use tag system for soluble protein production except unfolding process? uh yeah there we can use mbp tax or something like that we have not used work with those things we are first focused on the cell engineering strategy so we are uh, just uh, giving a brief about cell inter uh, uh, like engineering strategies for the production of uh, proteins uh, yes there is much scope for using the uh, mbp proteins or gst protein tax for solubilizing proteins and all those things we can use it yeah that's let me can do it in future yes Uh, yeah, I think uh, that's all. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ashish, for answering all the questions. Uh, now, this is for the participants. I request all the participants to fill the feedback uh, feedback form. The link is already there in the chat box. 
and uh, only the participants who fill the feedback form will be awarded the e-certificates. Apart from that, this recording will also be shared on our FB page and on the YouTube channel. So you can see the recording from there itself and you can share it with other people also if you want to share the knowledge. Uh, the next uh, webinar of the series will be held on 26th of June at 3 p.m. IST. So uh, before we conclude this wonderful uh, webinar for today, I would request the head of the department of biotechnology at IMS Engineering College, Professor Rashmi Chandra, to present the vote of thanks. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rashmi Chandra on behalf of biotechnology department of IMS Engineering College. Extends a hearty thanks to Dr. Rashmi. Prabhu for delivering wonderful talk on the process development of the pandemic using PTO or factory. I am very much sure everyone must have gained knowledge on the factory. Thanks, Dr. Asi, for gracing us your presence and taking out your valuable time. I appreciate the delegates from different institutions, professors, and faculty members for their participation. Also, I would like to extend my special thanks to Mr. Piranjan Kumar for arranging such an informative talk. Last but not least, I extend my big thanks to our whole department, including our bright students and each and every faculty member for their support. Thanks for making this talk a successful event. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ashish. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, you. Dr. Ashish. Uh, we are looking forward to the partic participation from all of you in the next webinar. Uh, till then, have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. See you then. Bye-bye. Bye, Asis. Okay. Bye bye. Rook, beta, rook, 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 rook. It's uh, it was very informative and I really enjoyed it. Although it's not meeting to my level, but uh, it's really good. I really enjoyed and seek too much information uh, to attend this webinar. But but I want I have a request in case of you do that because I didn't attend the previous webinar due to poor uh, internet connection and I'm out of your country, so that's why there is a time issue. So how I, how I can uh, see or attend that webinar previous webinar or how I can uh, fill the previous feedback and get the okay, uh, Mr. Bilal, so uh, you can uh, ping me on my WhatsApp number through which you must have received the link of this webinar. So we'll talk there. Oh, I'll so share you there. I'll share your WhatsApp number. Yeah. It's the very first time to attend your uh, your meeting. Well, because I I used to attend these type of meetings at uh, Zoom or you uh, YouTube link. It's the very first time to attend this, and okay. at that time, previously at uh, this day, uh, due to poor connectivity, I didn't attend your webinar. I'm from Pakistan, but I really enjoyed your webinar. I'm proud of you, your information, your everything. Okay, I'll send you the link on your email ID, on your registered email ID soon.
I I I also I have enrolled today. Okay, so you can ID. share your email ID here in the chat box. Uh, how? By a by message? Yeah, you can say, share by your email ID in the chat box here. Okay, okay. You can yeah. send me the feedback. Yes, also, yes, the previous. Yes. I, I I'll share. Okay, okay, okay. okay thank you, yeah. sir. What's your name? Okay. Yeah. What's your Please name, share. sir? What's your good name, Kumar. sir? It's prayer and prayer engine yeah. Kumar Wadi. Oh, yeah. I yeah. I'm posing to that that you are feeling yeah. so sorry so sorry yeah. sir. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No problem. Okay. I'm sharing you. Yeah. Uh, that is. I have shared right now. You can see at the chat box. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You have seen? I have. I got it. Have you? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. I got Thank it. Thank you very much. Okay. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, so much. Okay.
here in Jin Kumar sir. I get my certificate right now from your email, but I didn't get the previous uh, webinar link as well as uh, its uh, feedback form because I was too much interested. I have said it to you clearly that I have uh, some uh, connectivity issue and there is uh, also a clash in between our times, standard times because I am from that country, Pakistan, so you are from India too. So there is a difference of half an hour. So I don't know what is your what was your time at that time, or there is a connective issue, connectivity issue. So I think that uh, that webinar also it's the very first time to meet you at Google. Uh, I on, only used to meet or attend the class at uh, Zoom. You know that uh, nowadays due to pandemic, we have to attend our university as well as college classes at Zoom app. So uh, it's the very first time to attend uh, this class at uh, Google. So please issue that certificate and you also send me the link of uh, that webinar so that's why I'll be able to see on YouTube or any kind where you have uploaded. So today's webinar is very much but, uh, very uh, informative as well as exemplary uh, video um, quality, their voice, their pitch and how goodly the website has delivered to us. I really appreciate all of your team you are each and every behind of the camera, like the technical team also. I'm really proud of all of you. Stay blessed always. Hello, I am his team. I also want to uh, uh, add something like same happens with me i was not able to join the uh, link last time when this uh, this uh, this session was conducted on 18th of june so can i get that link so that i can see the complete uh, uh, lecture on that particular topic which was taught that day and uh, how i can like uh, 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 to that particular lecture if is there any sources please provide that us uh, and how i can get the certificate e certificate this time <laughs> 